would you guys introduce yourselves? You go first. Sure, we're the Camera family, Riley, Jimmy, Carly, Caitlin, and Kimball. Perfect. Uh, near Piedmont, South Dakota. I'd like to understand, and our watchers or viewers would like to know too, is there a specific priority order um, that things fall in when you think of the ranch's resources? Uh, first, of course, we do family. That's always most important. You want to make sure everything's all right in between because that's where you um, stack up all the other priorities. That's where the foundation is. And the next would probably be the land and the grass go hand in hand. Um, and then probably our cattle and then our equipment. So. Dad's nodding his head yes, so he must have got that all right. <laughs> I think. Mm -hmm. Tell me the story of how and, and if you recall when you recognized that, that this operation needed to do something to, to deal with the impacts of drought. Sure. So we come off uh, the 16-17 drought and that spring of 17 we were down to our last two bales and we were plum grazed out. We had no options um, and we finally we went to grass and, and, it, and it finally the rains came but it was... It was a frightening situation, and there I couldn't find any hay just to get us through. There just wasn't any, and I had I had been noticing, you know, in the years leading up to that, how our our cattle were grazing on the summer grass. We were, you know, ten acres per pair, and that's that's the standard of wisdom around this country. And and uh, we were leaving grass. They were they were overgrazing completely overgrazing the draws and the low spots and they were leaving the hilltops. Um, you know, I had estimated that, that there was 40% of that rangeland that wasn't getting utilized and the rest of it was, was overutilized. Mm -hmm. And that had to be fixed because that just fixing that could have got us through those bad years. And so that began my education to dig in deep, to try to figure out what we can do. I know we were uh, continuous summer grazing, so we um, we were a two pasture deal through the summer and now you know, it's taken us a while to get there and, and get our fence and our water to where we were, were, were in better shape but you know, last summer we were at 13 paddocks and we hopefully can double that maybe this year um, and so what we've achieved by that is we're, we're getting uniform distribution of grazing across the entire summer pasture as well as is extending the rest period for all these grasses. And it's really making a difference. And, and last year on some of it, we, we experimented with, we went to pretty high density on it to try to, to break up some of those oxidized grasses and get them to utilize it. So we're, we're really looking forward to see how that, that shapes up this year for this summer. But you know what, by doing that, we're, we're able to control our grazing better rather than having those cattle walk back and forth across that that pasture and, and walk that grass off and, and so we were actually able to leave grass last year and that's what got us through last year too was, was grazing part of the old grass from the year before and that works into our drought plan so that was that was the turning point for us that we needed to get this deal figured out and, and then we were, we were able to to buy out my folks and we more than doubled our cow herd again and, and I knew that you know we're, we're in uh, semi-arid land, western South Dakota, and drought's going to come. You know, we went through two years of record precipitation, and there was hay everywhere. And I think a lot of us took maybe took it for granted. And we that was when our drought plan started, when when the heavy rains were falling, because I knew this deal was going to turn around. And then that's so. You know, we've been trying to prepare for three years for this, and um, by by utilizing the forages that we grew on this place. And not relying on hay, getting our stocking rate correct, um, that got us through. We didn't have to buy any hay last year. We still have, we still have hay left over going into next year. So I feel pretty confident that we can, we can, with a little help from Mother Nature, we can make it through without having to drastically restock. And once we got that forage plan in, your stress level went down a lot. So that also <laughs> helped us out a lot too. <laughs> You had indicated that even with a 40% reduction in, in production or rain, I 
I guess I should say, you said as rain last season in 2021 that you were able to manage through. Could you shine a little more light on that? What yeah, that looked like a year ago when I was doing my grazing planning a year ago, so be uh, February of 21. And I mean, I knew we were deficient. Um, we just it stopped raining that June before that, and I mean most of our summer pastures didn't get catch a rain all summer, and and nothing into the fall. And I knew we were we were short, and it was it was starting to concern me, and and I I was seeking out and I. I was able to find some extra pasture early, like in February, and secure that, you know, in case it got bad. And that, that really helped to get some hairs out and, and uh, took some pressure off. And, and again, we didn't, <clears throat> we didn't keep any heifer calves last year. We just, I knew that we just didn't have the resources to keep them. And I wasn't going to buy hay to, uh, to get yearlings through. It's, it's, I've, I've fed enough yearlings. I know what it costs, and it's, and it's very expensive. So, um, you know, we, we, the, the lease I had, I don't have for this year. So we know, we know we're going to be short and I've already secured, um, corn stock grazing for the cow, the bulk of the cows for next winter. So regardless of it, if it does rain or doesn't, um, I think it's going to be a wise choice for us to get off here and, and rest and keep as much cover on these pastures as we can. So we're, we're just trying to prepare ourselves better for when it does rain that we'll have we're not hitting these grasses too hard that they'll they'll still recover and grow. I mean, we're thinking, trying to think long term and try not to take short term torn uh, cuts, I guess, and, and just squeak through. We'll just and and in that part of it is we would like to be fully stocked when the markets peak, and and so we don't we want to be prepared for that high point in the market and we want to capitalize on that as much as we can and and if we graze out here and then we have to sell out and so if we have options that are financially viable we're going to do it and and it's different um but it's a plan and and as the drought you know i mean we just miss this moisture and um it's nice to not be out waiting in snow right now, but it'd be nice to have this. We desperately need this moisture, but like I keep telling him, he, he's got a plan for next winter for the cows. He's, he's got our calves marketed. They got a home. Um, and so there's a lot of what ifs in between, but we have some those plans in place, and that can kind of help ease the burden as until we can get, you know, corn stocks, um, which can help with our stress level. And I'd also say don't be afraid to change plans because I know through it all we've changed a lot of plans and if we would stay on that route then it wouldn't have been as profitable or um, we wouldn't have gained so much off of it, but you know, if we have a plan. It sounds like you're a bit unique in securing things kind of in that late winter time frame, um, maybe before a lot of people are even talking about that upcoming growing season. Mm -hmm. um, is, do you see that as a risk, or is that just uh Well, it is a risk that, that, yeah, <laughs> they, you're laying that money out there, but I think by by knowing knowing what you've got, and and if you know you, know you need something, then the earlier you look for it before everybody else is, maybe you can grab it. And That's how we got our leases. Out. And supply and demand, I mean, we can we can either sit there and let it be used against us or we can use it for us. And and when and and you can look into the long term forecast quite a ways in advance and see what's happening. And and you can look into the markets. I mean, yeah, there's black swan events and things that happen that aren't known, but there's a lot of things that just happen. And, and you can look out and see that. And so by, you know, we can manage our risks by looking farther in advance and, and taking advantage of um, the supply and demand. But again, it comes back to giving us peace and emotionally, financially, 
Um, which is good because then when you have to make changes in the middle of, of your plan, um, it's not as so desperate. You're not desperate. Um, and you can sleep a little better at night knowing that, you know, yeah, I guess if you, if, if we have to use things or if we end up using things a little harder this summer, we know that by next winter, you know, we're going to get, we're going to be off of here. And, and so, you know, it's not always ideal. Every choice and decision we make isn't ideal. Um, but, you know, you, we just try to manage it. Um, and by making those choices long term helps, helps with that. Maybe I'm looking at them, but I wondered if you might be able to tell me what you see as some of the lasting values or benefits of having grazing plans um, that you revisit, observe, and adapt, um, as well as that drought slash disaster slash contingency plan as conditions change. Um, I think it adds a lot of assurance as we go on through disaster years or drought years or years where we not, might not have um, opportunities that we had um, the year before. Um, I think it definitely helps us get the big picture of um, our ranch and what we're doing. Um, and definitely in the good years, it helps us to be grateful. <laughs> so. Yeah, we just we made that decision to be more proactive instead of reactive what we're doing and we just having plans in place um, that we can work into and, and when, when these happen we have trigger dates and we know well, we, we probably better start working on this and start thinking about this and, and it, it just takes a lot of the maybe the guesswork and the, the stress and the not knowing out and, and yeah reducing the stress is probably the biggest thing for us because once you get the stress off it everything falls into place so yeah and quality life um to oh, yeah. enjoy our family and our kids you know we do work hard i believe kids with work ethic and skill are in a ruled world because they are few and getting fewer but um we like to play too and and so enjoying our kids and being able to enjoy our family and hopefully leave this land um, better, better for, for them. Um, they're the seventh generation on my husband's side and they're the sixth generation on my side to be in agriculture. And whether or not they pursue that, it's their life, it's their choice, but um, it's still for the future. Um, yeah, it's it is for for the kids and and for us too. I mean, we love it too. So we haven't talked too much about it, and you mentioned it just now, Riley. Trigger dates. Do you want to share maybe what those are for this operation? And and, and okay, there's a date on the calendar. What okay? Are you are you taking action on that day, or are you making a decision and then? I guess I don't have. For sure, set dates. We just have, you know, you know, by by May, if we if we're not getting the moisture, we need to, we need to really seriously consider what we're doing, um, you know. And, and in fall, fall moisture is crucial uh, for grass production the next year. And, and if we're not seeing that, we need to, you know, maybe we better not we better better not buy those extra cows, or we're not going to keep those yearlings, or, or what. You know, if we have a surplus, that's a different. Outside of, of just personal reflection and, and observation in the field, uh, were there any specific resources that you utilized to to come to this new grazing plan? Sure, I, I reached out to you first, Tance, through the local NRCS office. You were our DC at the time, and and got with Mitch Faulkner then, and we we started working on this and over over a period of a winter, fall and a winter. And, and started digging deep into a forage inventory, resource inventory, and what we had and what we could work with. And, and I knew, you know, we built that initial stocking rate on that. And I knew 
to get this right, I was going to have to control my grazing better and increase my harvest efficiency to run the amount of cows we were. It just it was right there black and white on the paper that the plan I thought it would work wasn't, wasn't going to work until we made some drastic changes. And, and I went to uh, uh, South Dakota Grassland Coalition's um, grazing school, and that helped put a lot of in perspective for me of what we needed to do, as well as uh, ranching for profit, another two-day school that I went to. And those were the probably the key drivers to implement the changes we needed to. But what sent you to those were tough situations. Oh, yeah. Financial, um, weather, you know, atlas, things that brought us to the end of ourselves and, and stress, you know, we just don't, there's things that you don't have to repeat in life. Um, in agriculture, there's so much that is out of our control. Um, but there's a lot of things that we can take better control of as producers. And that's what, um, we've chose to, to try to do is to take control of the things that we can control to minimize the stress because, you know, that's the, the hardest part about being an egg, the most wearing part. And so that, that drove him, um, to seek different ways. So. So, so we built that initial stocking rate with the forage or the, the resources we had, and that was built. We had a lot of excess forage that year, and <clears throat> you know we had we had the option of just turn the cattle out and. Um, or we had the option to to really utilize what we were given in the good years. And so um, she was nine months pregnant with our third daughter, and I just had to say that it, if we're going to do this, we got to do it now or we're never going to get it done with the baby coming in. So, so we started stringing our first poly wire and building, building paddocks for the cows. And she's out there pregnant and helping me, and the way we went. And so, you know, initially we were, I don't remember, uh, around 250 cows on, uh, we were giving them uh, five acres a day. So, um, and we started that in November. Uh, <clears throat> Jim Garrish says that if you're going to try something like this, it's best to do it with a dry cow because it's, it's pretty pretty tough to screw that up, so we did, and we went. We moved polywire all winter long. We had we had some pastures that had um, in excess of 4,500 pounds per acre, and we were a, the the utilization we were able to get over that was incredible. And and in doing that, we we hardly had to feed any hay, and those cows were doing just fine. And, and you know we say, well, what about snow and the weather? And well, we had. We had 80 inches of snow that winter, off and on. It would come heavy, and, and we'd have it around, and it would melt. But we were we were diligent with what we did, and we kept and we kept on with the plan. And you know, we got we got through that year with you know 400 cows, and I think we fed 250 bales of hay. And we, we so we were able to use that surplus forage in a, an efficient manner, and it saved that hay for now when we needed it. Because that was my deal was you know. We, uh, we're going to need this. We put up a record amount of hay. Um, we're going to need that down the road. So so let's be wise in how we use it. Um, use the resources that, that God gave us with the moisture we had. And let's plan for this drought that's going to come. Might be next year. Might be three years from now. But we, we know it's going to come. You know, we were just counting up the other day. With, in the last 20 years we've been ranching, I think we've had really six good years above average um, forage and the rest have been seemed like been tough so so we're we're kind of we look at this in a different way that you know we're we probably better be stocked uh, for the dry years and then you know the better years then we can we can do whatever we need when we bring pairs in we've done that we've, we've kept yearlings 
Um, you know, we started this two years ago when it when it started getting dry, and we got rid of our yearlings early. So we knew we were going to need that forage for our cows to get to keep the cow herd. And the, that next year, we well, we didn't keep heifers for two years. We just bought a few cows to keep our numbers up because I didn't want to allocate those resources to a yearling herd that would end up taking away from the cow herd, which is crucial to our cash flow to get through. Um, and so so we don't have any heifers right now. We just made that decision. We've cut our stocking rate down by about 25% um, to prepare for this, to get through, because I knew you know, if we had to buy $300 hay, it would break us really fast. And I you see, we've been backed into that corner where we've been out of forage, and we just decided we're not doing that anymore. Um, the amount of stress that we have to go through at that time is, is just more than we want to want to live with so we just we try to plan plan as best as we can but when you come up with your grazing plan and you calculate how much forage that you know we have that and how long it's going to get us through um that that gives us that confidence that we are headed down the path that we want to be headed down because, you know, there's not a lot of people around here that are stringing poly wire and grazing their cows in the winter. And, and so and so to have this plan on paper and have it calculated right, because it is, it's crazy when everybody's feeding hay and, and you do, you kind of feel sorry for your cows. I, I was the one who kind of felt sorry for them and I, it makes me feel good. I It used to make me feel good to go roll out a bale of hay, and it made me feel like I was doing something good for my cows. And and But when he has a, the grazing plan all calculated on a paper, and he can confidently say, well, this is, you're getting what the nutrition they need. Um, and, and you can. You can implement your program and have confidence in that in spite of, you know, what what you've done in the past and and how you feel because but in the long run we our cattle are happier grazing they are much happier because they get to move to fresh pasture they're not standing on you know laying on soiled ground and and they're grazers by nature and that's what they want to go do so yesterday we were checking cows and those cows wanted to move but they were so full dad told us dad, dad told me if we went and rolled out a bale, they wouldn't eat it because they had so much there already for them. and They get more out of that than normal bale. So. Do you want to talk about how we did our forage inventory last September? Yeah, so we went out to all of our pastures. Um, we kind of went to a spot that kind of had an average of all of our grass. We met, went to multiple pastures, the pasture that we were most concerned about or hadn't already been on. Um, we used the ring. Um, and then we cut it and put it in the bag and then clipped it, yeah, and weighed it, made sure to dry it out, and then we used, and then we did also do that with our cover crop, and with all that information together, <clears throat> we had the assurance that we were going to make it through, at least for now, but um, yeah. And we made it through the winter. Yeah. <laughs> so. And, with and grass to spare. With grass so. to spare, and we're we're calving on last year's grass, or will be here to April what, thirteenth today. I Cows will start calving here in a week or ten days, and so we still have old grass to use up. It's the green isn't coming very hard, and but we know we know we try to plan ahead of time how much forage we have so we don't run out. And so. having that ins assurance, because again, there's in agriculture there's so many things that are out of our control, but having that assurance and knowing that in a year like this, when hay is so expensive, that we know we can still make our you know make our goal and not blow our budget and and that's that gives us peace so so are your folks a little easier to get along with now they are yep yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> we're not rolling out bills every day so i bet i bet they're happy not to buy mm -hmm. almost five dollar diesel for mm -hmm. the tractor too mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. oh. yeah lots of factors 
So do you expect your land, you've got a history of managing in this way, to recover really quickly when favorable conditions return and we get rain? Uh, personally, I don't think so. Um, our soil is currently so deprived of moisture. Um, it's not used to having so much rain added into it. I don't think it um, take it as well. A lot of it would probably run off. Um, I think an inch of rain would definitely green us up a lot. We would see a difference in that, but I think we would need a lot more steady conditions instead of one, like, three inch downpour to actually see changes. So what if, what if we do see a, a return to normal conditions in springtime, April, May, and June are our key months, most important for rainfall or snow? Mm -hmm. um, if, if we kind of get the ship right and we're following that normal path, you think, you think it would look good then? Yeah, probably as we go on, continue our soil keeps getting used to it. If we, if we got enough we're litter on the pastures yeah. enough to allow it and the grasses to come and get I, a head start and um, get to growing. And on these dry years, once you have the litter done down, it's helping our soils um, get more mellow. And as it comes down, it's going to soak it in more. So, yeah, in some cases, some cases no, but it kind of depends on where you are. Let's keep going with that thought. So let's say it rains four inches in the next month. Mm -hmm. Things are going to change. They're going to start looking really good. And it'll be really tempting to just turn out mm -hmm. and, and uh, let the cows do what they do. Is that the best idea for every pasture? Well, even if you have a good year, you don't want to turn your cows out. Is there a minimum amount of surface protection or plant litter that you choose to leave behind? Um, I, we've gone out to some of the least pasture and they don't graze throughout the spring when the Kentucky bluegrass is prominent and growing. Um, we can tell that there's way too much litter there. Um, Normally on our country and our specific land, that's out in St. Ange, um, but in our specific land we like to leave quite a bit because um, we're arid and um, we want to get as much moisture as, in, as, as we can and from so much erosion that's happened um, over the past hundreds of years, um, getting that litter down and then decomposing it, adding, adding that soil back on. but. Uh, no, we don't really have a specific um, lit amount of litter. We want to get so every every inch of ground is covered. But um, since we graze in the spring in specific pastures, we don't have a problem with too much. So and just know that we we like to get a, a good handful between our feet and, mm -hmm. and know that we've got the ground covered all the time. Mm -hmm. We target our grazing at. 35 to 40 percent utilization, so we know we're always leaving, leaving plenty of grass behind because we're gonna, we might need it next year. And you can tell when you've added enough litter in a year like this when you dig down deep and you still have enough moisture in it. It's not powdering in your hands. So. so leaving behind that much grass isn't as common as maybe it could be across the country. Some might even call it wasted grass. What benefits do you see for leaving behind that, that kind of residue cover? Well, as I talked about, over time it decomposes, adding um, lost toss, topsoil on top of your already existent soil. Um, it, in, it catches rain better. It's not like a bomb exploding on the um, uncovered grass. It doesn't compact it. Um, it's like an umbrella or a blanket in some, when it's cold or hot. It leaves our soil cool. Um, it doesn't kill off what, uh, what soil microbes we already have there. Um, some people call it wasted grass, but how dare them? Uh, that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> I drove by this weekend, this ranch, and I saw you out installing pipeline. It was cold and windy, and I kind of felt sorry for you. <laughs> um, but you're doing something, um, even amidst what looks to be probably a short grass year. You're, you're preparing your infrastructure so that you have the ability to graze that pasture um, where it's 
stock dams are, have gone dry. Mm -hmm. So, I want to know what role water developments play on this ranch. Well, they're pretty crucial. I mean, we've typically we've relied on dam water, you know, for 100 years. And, and we can't rely on that anymore. It's uh, it's proven itself this year. You know, and we're here. We are. You know, we were, I was waiting. Maybe we'd catch some snow and get some runoff. And, and part of this is to lease ground. And you hate to develop <clears throat> water on on ground you don't own, but we don't have a choice right now. And so, um, I mean, we went that route last year, and, and we ran out of water on some of our summer pasture, and I had to haul water, I hauled a lot of water. And, but it was what we had to do to get through, and you know we we just had decided here that you know we we're just going to have to pay for some of this out of our pocket and get, and get ahead of this the, the pipeline and start expanding on. I can't wait, and I partnered on a trencher and you know away we went. And luckily we we found some pipe and we're you know, trenching the water line in in March. And we're you know one of the things we we did was we we've, we've combined. And we, we run the cows in one herd, so we don't, we're not necessarily running as much uh, poly wire as we were. We're still going to do quite a bit, but, but by running in one herd, we can, we can, we can give the, the pastures adequate rest and still get the harvest efficiency that we, we desire. But in doing that, then, found out that, that all the previous pipeline infrastructure that we had is in, inadequate. And... You that many cows in one bunch, they drink a lot of water, and so we've had to we had to replace all uh, our pump system here in the last week. Spent a lot of money on that to get enough pressure and flow, and then we have a storage tank uh, trailer that we can take out on the hydrant end and drop tanks, and so then we got you know in the neighborhood of five or six thousand gallons of storage out on the end, and that takes that's that buffer there that. That we can get through. Once some cows are full, then we just seem to get along all right. But we still got a long ways to go on water infrastructure. Where we want to get to, we're, we're getting there slowly. So. You move from one paddock to the next fairly rapidly. Mm -hmm. um, it's not the season long any any longer. Uh, did you have to make some adjustments on on the watering system, or do you have some temporary? We've like? got um, temporary, and this will be the third year, third summer we've done that on, on our summer grass. I mean, up there it's just not feasible for a well for us. It's um, it's thirty four hundred feet to a well, and we just we can't outlay that much money. So we are relying on the surface water that we do have, and we <clears throat> well, we understand that's I mean that's our most important deal out there, and so we we fenced out those dams. Uh, this will be the third year on that. I have a solar pump system rigged up that we pump out of the dam or the dugout through a pipe into the storage tra trailer to to the cows, and that that keeps the cows from mucking up uh, the dam water and preserves the, it's preserving the integrity of the dam bank, you know, just to keep that that resource there long term. But I mean, it's it is a lot of water, a lot of work. And getting that done, but last summer when I went up, I went up one day, and you know it's 110 degrees up there, and, and I get up there to check water, and there's 20 calves up there to the tanks to drink, and that makes it all worth it to me that those calves can get a clean drink of water and not have to wait out in the slop uh, to get a mucky drink. So, you know that's that's probably the biggest thing we've done is is to have it pumping on those dams, and it's really working. All right, guys, how in times of hardship like this, when, when a lot of the cows have probably had to leave the place or, or are being fed at another location, how do you diversify your income stream just to meet your obligations? You got it. So I guess we, we have made decisions based on every year and the need for that year financially, um, resource-wise. Um, We've taken in cattle. We've sold down cattle. We um, we've got both gotten pound jobs at different times. Um, 
I stayed home and took care of cows. He went to work full time. Um, we basically have just done what we've had to do for that time, um, just to be able to reach our long-term goals. Um, so whatever it took to, to meet those long-term goals, that's what we did. And it wasn't always exactly what we wanted to do, um, but we knew, we knew that if we did that short-term, that we could meet our long-term goals and reach that. And so it made it bearable. <laughs> So, but I know the key to success in anything that you're doing, I believe, is, is to seek out individuals that you do admire, um, who they are and, and what they do, ask them for advice, but also, um, you know, take, take their, you know, their criticism or their advice how to change and how to grow and, and, um, you know, and, and do to keep you accountable because if you don't, if you don't have that, um, you do, we all just kind of get, um, pretty just relaxed with. Cause most times when they're trying to tell you something, they've gone through that experience and they want, they want, they would want that, um, that advice, same advice when they were going through that situation. Cause you know, that has happened to us. So. Right. And something else too. I mean, you don't, you don't necessarily want to take advice from everybody either. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so one year, you know, we realized by keeping our cows, we were going to go broke. And so the best thing that we could do for our family and, and for our business was to sell our cows. And um, I'm someone that can talk... I could talk to anybody, <laughs> but um, I didn't talk for three days. I mean, I couldn't speak. Um, it was very hard, but um, <laughs> but it was the right, looking back, it was the right decision, and um, it wasn't easy, but it, again, it helped us accomplish our long-term goals, um, and so it achieved it achieved our short-term goal of just not going broke. So the the alternative was to feed through it? To feed through it, take on more debt that we were not going to be able to pay out and get cashed out by the bank. And so we just made a decision. We have this, we have this road to take or this road to take. And, you know, they both aren't going to be very enjoyable, but what's our long-term goal? well, to stay in business. So, you know, the only thing we did wrong is I didn't let my husband sell all the cows. <laughs> That's the only thing we did wrong. <laughs> but I, I believe that, you know, we do, we have to seek out, seek out someone, whether it's a, a spiritual mentor, a Bible study, a book club, a mom's group, it's hard. It's hard to get away. We're all busy. Everybody, everybody's busy, and we can make a thousand excuses. I mean, we all have very valid excuses. You know, when you have kids and animals that rely on you, that's a big deal, and you can use that as any excuse to get out of any obligation or anything, but I know um, the things that are the hardest to do are usually the most rewarding, and 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 so it's, it's so important, you know, I know with Riley and his Grassland Coalition group, it's so hard to get away. I mean, you know, we have three kids. One, she's a toddler. Um, we ranch, we homeschool. I mean, I, I have a hundred excuses just like everybody else. But what he, the knowledge that he gleans, the confidence, um, but it just, and, and the friendship and, mentorship that he gets out of that it's so important and it it's it's life-changing and it just re reboots you and spurs you on because you know when where we when we live and work in the same place all the time it's always here and you can't get away and it's almost you can become accustomed to the problems that are already there and yeah and, and get different and it weighs you down and 
And unless you get out and get off the place or get around people that have a fresh perspective on things, it's it's hard to see 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 your problems in a different light. Um, and and so yeah, making time to get off out and and do things is important, even if it's just for a couple hours. It's it's worth it. It's worth it. So I've had to seek out a real, a, a core group of people, uh, friends and business partners and, and uh, like-minded individuals, and we bounce crazy ideas off each other and tell us if we're wrong or we think we're right, and that might work, and, and then we hold each other accountable for it. And, and that, just having that, that support there, that, that keeps me going. Otherwise, we we just quit and take the easy way out, probably. Hold us accountable for. Hold us accountable for what we do. But I think you talked about what I was gonna say. So. Is that kind of what? You're doing? Together, so, but it definitely takes a team, because when when one is um, to get through those situations, because when one is low. The other one can carry the other one through, and and it does take a team, and we're all a team. This is our team. We're missing Kimball, but one more thing. She's the up and comer teammate, but <laughs> hopefully she'll pull her weight someday. <laughs> but it is it it's it's about working together and and having having um, combined goals set and reaching those because it is it's it can be hard i hope that you speak to the ranchers many of them probably are neighbors and friends that feel like they're out of options they're out of grass the green like you said riley isn't coming on as rapidly here in mid-april as it has in years past in part due to temperature in part and maybe large part due to lack of moisture starting to clear back last fall to those that feel like they're out of options, do you have any any tips or, or messages of hope for them? That's a, being hopeless is a really hard place to be and we've been there. Um, but, you know, you can use that to set the stage to be determined to come up with solutions for those for the future, because in agriculture it's cyclical. Things cycle back around. Drought is cyclical. Markets are cyclical. It all it all cycles back around. And so, you can choose today to make different choices that affect that affect you long term. And when we finally decided to do that, we were sitting with our calves. We had gathered. It was a stressful gather. Sorted had trucked all our calves to town 50 miles to the sale barn and um, and they were bringing, you know, $200 below our break even. And um, Carly leaned over to me and said, Mom, what's wrong? And and I, I didn't even realize, but I, you know, I had that look because it was hopeless because we knew that was, that was it for us. Um, but, you know, uh, God had different plans that day, and we calves brought what they needed to bring. But on the truck ride back to go to go get our horses and get everything situated at the pasture, Riley and I just decided we're like, "This is I don't want to do this, be in this position again." Because I felt like I lost maybe a couple of my nine lives if I have that many, <laughs> and I just it's it's not a fun position to be in. And, you know, you, you don't want your kid asking you that tough question, Mom, what's wrong? And you can't really explain it to them, but they, they know something's wrong. And so, anyway, we just determined on the trek ride back that we were going to do it differently. And that was it for us. I mean, if you continually make the same choices, the same outcome is going to happen. And that's up to us to make those changes. And so... We, so I guess my advice to people is, is 
you know, find where those hard, those, those hard things that cause great effect on your family and your business and figure out what you have control over and, and change it and do it. And it's not easy. Change is hard. I mean, I, I'm usually the one that is the, the hardest sell in this family. <laughs> and, but, um, I, if, if you come at it with the resources that different places offer, um, and, you know, come at it in an analytical way, like my husband's very analytical and, and to say it works on paper and now let's just, we just got to go do it. Um, and, and take back some of that control because, it, it is, it's hard, and being in hopeless position, it's, it's no fun. We've been there more than we care to ever be again, but, um, but take control. Take control of what you can change and do it, and seek out resources, and, and don't be afraid, and, and find, and find people that you admire how they, you know, how their family is, how their business is, what they're doing, and ask them questions. Um, ask them questions how and why and what do you think, and, but then go out and, and Riley's always, he does, well, let's just do it then. This is what we're doing. We're doing it. And so, and then go do it, and then reevaluate, and so, and make changes from there. But there are things in agriculture we can take control of, but it, but it takes different, making different choices and, and that's okay.